Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the July edition of the First Bank Center for Family Owned Businesses webinar series. We're excited to have you with us today uh, from wherever you may be in Southern California, Northern California, St. Louis, or, or wherever you be, wherever you are, <laughs> wherever you be. There we go. I'm already off to a good start, huh, Murph? So we, we do these monthly webinars for you, the family business owner and leader. Uh, ideally, the, the purpose of these is to bring you tools and ideas and research and techniques that can help you manage and run your family owned business more effectively. We're excited about our webinar today with my friend Murph of JK Murphy Advisors. We'll talk more about him and his business here shortly. But first, as we do each month, for those who are joining us for the first time, we share a message from our chairman and and owner of the bank, Michael Deerberg, about First Bank and the Center for Family Owned Businesses. So watch this video and we'll be right back. Family business is so much more than just business as usual. It takes an entirely different mindset, a different vision. You know a bright future is found in strong traditions. You see the freedom in looking further down the road. As part of the fourth generation of my family to help lead First Bank, I know we share your vision. That's why we've created the First Bank Center for Family-Owned Businesses to share our experience with monthly webinars, tailored products, tools, and education specific to family-owned businesses. Your vision is our vision. Let our experience be yours. Let's see what your future can be. Let me just tell you a little bit about uh, John Murphy or Murph as he's affectionately known. He has spent his career working with private business owners to successfully achieve their growth stories, acting in a consulting and advisory board type role. I've met Murph many years ago and he's worked with several family businesses that we know, not only for First Bank, but also just ones that I've been with in the past in my previous role. After 20 years as, as an investment banker, Murph started JKMA in 2004 and put his, we think like a buyer, not an owner philosophy to work. And he's gonna talk more about that today. His straightforward yet patient hands-on approach provides clients with the trustworthy partner they need to meet their strategic growth liquidity, succession, market value, risk tolerance, and shareholder transition objectives. He's also been an active angel investor for the last 15 years, which gives him broad insights to apply to his consulting clients. Whether it's at the poker table or navigating turbulent waters, Murph's poker face gives nothing away. He's a dedicated Green Bay Packers fan and a Wisconsin Badgers fan who graduated from the University of Wisconsin with a BA in finance and marketing and holds an MBA in finance from the University of Chicago. Murph, it's great to see you. Great to have you with us. Thank you for joining us on our First Bank Center for Family-Owned Businesses webinar today. Thank you, Ed, for uh, that kind introduction and for the opportunity to be here today. I'm delighted. Um, good morning and good afternoon, everybody, from wherever you're calling from. Uh, we're going to talk today about uh, why market value is an important consideration for you in running your business, whether you have any intent, no intention of selling or not. Um, just a, a quick uh, addition to my background that Ed mentioned. So I'm a former investment banker. And what that taught me was it taught me how, uh, how buyers think. And we're going to talk about that a little later, as, as Ed said, and it's an, it's an important uh, part of our consulting practice. The other thing that, that it taught me is the 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 way I competed as an investment banker, as I was building a relationship towards a transaction, is I would ask the owner, "What problems do you have? What can I help you think through?" And I became a problem solver. And then when I had the opportunity to do that full time, almost twenty years ago, I decided I wanted to be a problem solver and not um, and not an investment banker. So we focus on solving problems, particularly improving performance and value. My two colleagues, Andy and Ivan, are on the call today. So um, shout out to Andy and Ivan. Thank you for joining. And uh, what, uh, the, before we get started, I want to make sure to say, please ask questions as we go. I'm, I'm not a big believer in waiting till the end. So if there's something that I said that you want more clarification on or don't agree with or could be more help, helpfully articulated a different way, please ask. So let me um, give me one second. I'm going to share my screen. Um, how many of these, how many of these um, uh, bullet points describe you? And I, my style is to put a number, a little bit of more information that I talk about on the page. So if I don't go over something that you like to talk about, please ask as well. Um, 
How many of you have experienced this? You and your partners don't get a, don't agree on where to go to drive the business on important issues. Um, you can't hire or keep great leaders, whether they're part of the family or not. And it's hard to execute the plan to scale your business. I think it's helpful to perhaps define how I think of scale. You probably have heard the word. I know there's a lot of books written about it. It's growth where margins increase. To me, that's scale. So the plan for growth is, is such a strong one that you're, you're growing uh, and taking your fixed costs and dividing them across greater revenue. So when I say scale, that's what I mean. Um, and if you're not focused on these things, uh, what are you focused on? What are your goals and objectives? And we're gonna talk about why that's important these days. So let's talk about sort of the, the baseline, the foundation of uh, market value. So you probably are all aware of the, the world of M&A um, where private equity and uh, strategic buyers and family offices provide growth equity and liquidity equity, and then banks, finance companies, and private debt funds who have been growing like crazy over the last five years um, provide the working capital. Both these groups of uh, uh, constituencies they think unemotionally and analytically about the business they buy or uh, the lend to. And what they care about is performance. Performance that relates to uh, market value for private equity groups and performance that relates to sustainable cash flow for, for lenders. And I believe, this is my premise at the bottom of the page, is that whether you intend to sell your business ever or not, caring about your market value, what it is and how to make it better, will help improve the company. and. Incidentally, this idea that I want to uh, expand on a little bit is analyzing your business unemotionally or analytically. I think we call it thinking like a buyer, not an owner. A buyer, not an owner, will also improve improve your business. So let's talk for just a second about what we mean when we say um, thinking like a buyer, not an owner. So these are some examples of how I think of the difference between sometimes owners and buyers. Um, the first one's important. We often find that companies fund too many growth initiatives. And they tend to fund many growth initiatives because they haven't analyzed which is the best one. So they plant a lot of seeds, and if using the analogy of a garden, where you plant a lot of seeds. Well, it's easy to plant seeds, but it's harder to nurture those seeds till they become fully great flowers. And what I find is with a, an unemotional buyer, um, or just anybody that's unemotional about it, uh, and, and analyzing it from the outside in is they tend to prioritize what the best growth initiatives are and how to how to plant the best seeds. Uh, dropping down to uh, uh, bullet point number four, we find this a lot um, in certain in many companies. Everybody wears a lot of hats, and it's certainly true as companies begin to grow. I see this a lot with the companies that I uh, invest in as an angel investor. Everybody wears a lot of hats. It's just the way the world works. But sooner or later, you get to a point in the company where you need to specialize management. Um, we're working with a, a company right now that's in the financial services business. In fact, it's a title insurance company. And its growth is uh, to the point where we need to specialize. And one of the key recommendations we made is to create a new management team, senior leadership team under the owner that will manage the key aspects of the business, whereas before they had sort of everybody wearing a lot of hats. So now that we've uh, talked about the idea of thinking like a buyer, not an owner, let's talk about market value, what it is. This is generally the way that market value is computed for most middle market companies, most private companies. Um, there are exceptions if you're a life sciences business, for example, um, or uh, a very specialized technology company with subscription revenue that may be based on a, a multiple of revenue as opposed to trailing cash flow. But most companies tend to follow the rule of trailing 12-month EBITDA earnings before interest taxes and depreciation, plus addbacks times a multiple equals market value, less debt, uh, if there is any, plus cash, whatever cash you have on the balance sheet, uh, less, less normal working capital equals market value, uh, market equity value. So let's talk about trailing earnings before interest taxes and depreciation is a pretty straightforward concept. I'm sure you all uh, calculate it. Um, private company addbacks. So the idea is to get the true operating cash flow of a business. So anything that a private owner does to a company that uh, 
somebody else wouldn't. So for example, non-essential family on the payroll, excess owner's comp, long-term investments that aren't going to pay off for a while. Those are tend to be added back to uh, the reported cash flow to see what, um, and if you're a big um, uh, write off of everything and not capitalize everything that, that or capitalize things that might be, that's another add back. Um, uh, those are kind of the, the key ones. And then times a multiple. So every industry has a set of multiples that people work with. They're based on public companies in your industry. If there aren't, maybe there's some private companies that have sold where there's transaction information that you can get. And the important thing of this, to me, this slide is anything that you do that increases cash flow or the multiple will increase value. Does anybody have any uh, questions so far? Okay. Um, so why should you care about market value? Now that we've defined it, let's talk about why I, what I've learned over the years as why it should be important. I think the number one thing is most of your competitors probably care about market value. If they're publicly traded or if they're institutionally backed, whether that's private equity groups for more established companies or VCs for early, earlier stage, they care about market value because that's the number, that's one of the key reasons why they're in that business, whether they started it from scratch in the case of VCs or whether uh, private equity groups bought a more established company that already been operating. And to the extent that you're facing these competitors in the marketplace, will you sub-optimize decisions relative to them, the decisions that they're making um, because you aren't as focused on market value? Uh, the, the middle one I think is really important. Well, they're all important, but, you know, happier customers. So I've worked with a lot of e-commerce businesses and um, uh, I've happened to work with uh, two cosmetic and one apparel. And there's this concept of the lifetime value of a customer that some of you may know, and certainly those who are consumer facing probably know. Um, and that is uh, over the lifetime, how much is this customer going to buy of your product? So in the case of cosmetic customer, it's a lot because women buy cosmetics all the time. In the case of a con uh, cl clothing business, it's um, not necessarily, you don't tend to buy it as much or in the case of a, uh, uh, you know, a, a television set or a, a table, you don't buy as many in your lifetime. But the idea of having happier customers shows up in lifetime value of a customer because if they like your product and like your service and they believe that you're authentic, then uh, you're going to have a better lifetime value. The fourth one is really important to me because you know, they say real estate's about location, location, location. And a lot of times valuing private companies is about management, management, management. So what kind of management team do you have? Can you hire and keep great people as we talked about earlier? And my premise is that everybody wants to work for a winner. People want to work for a company that's going places because it has more opportunity generally for them. And it's more fun. It's less fun working for a company that struggles and has, um, uh, is is having a tough time operating. And here's the other thing that I found in my 40 plus years working both as a banker and a consultant is I've worked for owners where they feel like they think that the the in the, the employees don't don't feel the same thing they feel. And my my experience has been companies are like a family and everybody seems to know if if the owners are can't agree on where to drive the business, people feel it because it tends to slow the company down. If if the company's struggling, people feel it. And so the idea of why care about market value, I think because it, in one part is it leads to a company that people want to, more people want to work for. As I mentioned, people want to have a winner. Oh, wait, there's a question here. Yeah, you see that it says, how do you handle fully depreciated assets like long-owned real estate? And then I have a question after that for you as well. Uh, th those don't tend to, if the answer, if the question was, um, how do they factor into value? They, they're not part of the value of the company. My guess is you probably own the real estate separately. So that would be, um, that would be part of uh, a separate calculation for what the real estate's worth, whether it's being used at its highest and best use, whether you're, you're being charged, the company's being charged fair market rent or above fair market rent. Um, so that tends to not get involved with the with the value of the company, but it's related, of course, because it's a, a key facility. And I've actually worked, uh, one of my clients was a retailer and 
we valued the company separate from the real estate and the real estate, we told the buyers, in this case, they wanted to sell. This was a family business. Four out of the six top key members of the, of the management team had the same last name and they had decided to sell. And um, we told them, we told the buyers, we'll either rent it at this rate or sell it to you at, at, at this leap. You can buy the real estate at this rate or we'll lease it at this rate. Either way, we don't care. And so it became it became uh, less important to the overall value of the company. But if you have great real estate, it's going to be worth something whether you sell your business or not. I hope that helps. Ed, what what uh, question yeah. did you have? You were touching on on um, leadership and ownership. You know, communicating with their employees that oftentimes the employees do care just as much as the leadership does. Talk a little bit about transparency. I know there's two schools of thought. You don't want to like scare everybody with you know, numbers that may not be the numbers they want to see, but at the same time, you don't want to surprise people either. Talk about how you've worked with that with some of your clients. That's a great question. Um, and by the way, to the audience, it wasn't a plant at all. No, uh, came to me as you were talking. <laughs> so I've been working for over 40 years in the financial world. I'd say 96% of the companies that I've worked for is that a banker or a consultant are private. All the companies that I've worked for as a consultant have been private. A few were public as um, in, when I was an investment banker. And I know of two companies that shared full financials with the, with, with the man, with not only the management team, but the entire company. So most my experience tells me that most owners are not transparent when it comes to important things like bottom line, et cetera. What I found is sharing, we talked, there was a comment or a bullet point a few, a few pages earlier talking about KPI packages. I find that uh, sharing gross margin and everything that goes in gross margin and, and sometimes even down to EBITDA, which means all of SGNA, can be very helpful for the senior leadership team because they can see then the results of the efforts that they're putting in to create more value, to create more growth, to create better margins, whatever the goals that you've set for your, for your company. Now, it turns out as a corollary to that, if you ever decide to sell your business, you do need to be more transparent. You need to be transparent with the people that you're thinking of selling to. That's a different issue. Um, because I think, Ed, the one you were talking about is what do you do with your management team? My, my sense is, one of my mottos is nothing good happens without communication. And part of that communication with your senior leadership team is to show them what's going on. So uh, it's it's been rare that people show to everybody, but it's more common. And I think the right way to go with sharing it with your leadership team, because it just lets them be part of the team. And they know they know what the what's at stake. And they they can also yeah, I think the big one is they feel part of the team and they can also see directly like what what are they doing? If I've been working this way for so long, but it hasn't moved the needle on margins, well, maybe I have to try something different. So um, so that's how I feel about transparency. And this yeah, question, I agree. I think your employees have a lot of insight that they could share and they can't share it with you if they don't know what's going on. So appreciate that very much. Yeah, I mean, I I, I don't know if this is a great analogy, but it's to me, it's like a family. I mean, if the kids know if the parents aren't getting along, you know, the kids figure it out. And I think the same thing is true of, of in businesses, because it's a different kind of family, whether it's family owned or not, it's a, it's a, it's a community. And so, especially with the senior leadership team, I would, if I would be fully transparent with them because I just, it, it makes them feel part of the, the process. The last bullet point on page six, why you should care about market value, more acceptable risk tolerance trade-offs. So to me, you know, the way I look at the world is what's the expected value of this growth initiative or this action that you're going to take in your company, whether it's to improve margins or grow revenue, um, build a better management team. What's the, what's the, uh, what's the payoff and what's the risk of getting there? So, um, for example, we we worked with an e-commerce company that was uh, apparel, and two thirds of their business was direct to consumer, and a third was uh, other e-tailers. And we kept asking, "Why are you giving these other e-tailers a fifty percent discount?" For those of you who have brands, that's a typical discount for a brand uh, uh, retailer relationship. 
to compete with you for the same person you're trying to find to sell your full margin product to you through your DTC business? And the answer was, because that's the way we've always done it. And we, we felt like, well, here's a way that create, will create more value. So we suggested they get rid of the third of their company, shrink, get rid of the worst revenue, and just go back with, continue forward with um, the best revenue. And mind you, they had been, they hired us because they had been approached by a, 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 a strategic that wanted to buy them. So we told them, you're going to have to wait 12 months, but here's the payoff, which we, we thought was a doubling the value of the company. Here's the risk. Here's the things we're going to have to do in order to affect the change. And what they, what they decided was that the risk was worth it. They felt the risk was manageable and the payoff was worth it. So I, this idea of risk is one that we spend a lot of time on because there's lots of different risk in your business. Uh, we worked with another company that, uh, by the way, we increased the value two and a half times for, in 19 months because they sold at the end of 19 months. We started 19 months earlier. Um, can't promise that every time, but it, in that particular case, it actually worked out because when we interviewed the management team, the DNA of the company was truly online as opposed to uh, uh, wholesale in any sorts. So this idea of risk, particularly with uh, family businesses, I've spent time in my career talking to, sometimes families think that they're, they're not taking risk and, they're and I tell them, I try to convince them they're taking more risk by not taking risk. Let me give you an example. I worked for a family business, second generation. Second generation was running it. First generation had bought it and second generation had created the value. And um, the, it was two sets of families, shareholders. The average shareholder age was 73 years old. So when it came time to putting a bank term loan to fund a new acquisition or to build another plant, this was a regional business, so they had plants all over the country. When it came time to kind of stepping out, which was needed to compete with the companies that they were competing with, the shareholder group said, you know what, we, we, we're not up for that risk. And I finally suggested to them, because it turned out 10 years later, they were competing, there was no more mom and pops like them in their industry. They were competing against big strategics that did a lot of, made a lot of products in many parts of the world. And this company made one product in one part of the world. So there was, they decided it wasn't worth the payoff. The risk wasn't worth the payoff because of where they were in their lifespan. They would prefer to have the money back as opposed to put new money out. So this idea of how much risk are you prepared to take and how much risk should you take is a question that we tend to weigh in on uh, a lot. So now that we've talked about sort of my premise of why you should care about market value. What about, you know, guidelines and then how do you, how do you improve market value? So those are the next two things that we're going to talk about. So again, I'm not going to talk about all of these, but um, some of the ones that I feel like um, should be, uh, should be thought of. So any, any increase in normalized revenue margins or, or cash flow will increase market value. And my premise is you need to focus both on revenue growth and margins because all revenue is not created equal. I mentioned that earlier. That's We try to be um, unbiased when we go into every assignment because we want to base our recommendations on everything we find there. But I do have one bias, and that is most companies all have some revenue that they shouldn't have. Uh, let me give you another example. We work for a pro pro for-profit school. They were not interested in selling the company. They just wanted to have a better performing company. They were artists and they created a school to train people to become artists like they were because there was no school when they came up. And one of the, one of the partners, uh, because he was an artist, loved the curriculum and he was in charge of the curriculum and he would, he would create two to three new classes every quarter. And um, so that meant finding classroom space, that meant finding a, a teacher, that meant developing curriculum and putting it out there to the world. So there was some cost to that, both in energy, time, and money. And what oftentimes happened is uh, the, they, by the end of the quarters, when the new quarter started, they would cancel two of them and start one new one because they didn't get enough people to sign up. So as we analyzed the business, we said, 
the best revenue of your company is the last 10 seats in every class because you have no more cost, no more insurance, no more rent, no more teacher salary, nothing. It's the best revenue that you have. So let's create a company that focuses first on the best revenue and then on that incremental revenue. So we, we suggested that they not create any new classes until the overall occupancy rate of the company was above 90%. And it transformed the profitability of the business because they were adding too much bad revenue to the to the good revenue every month, uh, uh, to the regular revenue every month, and not focusing on the good revenue, which was that last 10 seats. Just like an airline, once that flight takes off, once that class meets, or once the people that can sign up for it and they it, they can no longer sign up for it, there's no more. There's that's the best revenue that they can find. Um, double down on your core competencies and develop new. Uh, authentic comp competencies. You know, doubling down on your core competencies is pretty clear. Um, if you ask me over the last 40 plus years that I've worked with companies, what's created the most value? It's been focus, hiring and keeping great people, and having conviction about where you're going. So this idea of focus on your core competencies and create more revenue, either by creating new products to sell to your existing customers or, or creating new new customers that you can sell your existing products to. Some of both is probably the best way to go. And then let's talk about developing new authentic companies. So I'm I'm a big believer in not starting a nuclear waste disposal company if you're in the uh, if you're uh, making uh, uh, shirts to sell. You know, clearly that's not an authentic acquisition. But I look to the shoe industry for for you know some some guidelines on that. Nike, killed it when they started doing apparel because they made an authentic connection in the mind of the consumer between shoes and apparel. The apparel companies tried to do shoes and they couldn't do it very well because there wasn't that authentic connection in the mind of the consumer. You know, Nike's a marketing machine and they um, and they were able to make it work. But that's that's what I mean about, you know, new authentic competencies, whether that's brand extensions, acquisitions, or other growth initiatives that that are authentic in the minds of the consumer. We've got another question here, Ed. Yeah, Murph, this is a really well-timed good question. Um, is it okay to keep poor performing product lines because they produce revenue and spread overhead? All right, well, again, I have a bias here. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to have biases. Generally, the answer is no. I mean, a skew analysis is one of the um, things we typically do for our clients, and we always find I've never found a client that needed more SKUs. So um, I'm waiting on that one. I don't know whether that will happen, but um, I understand also, I had a, a client in the um, uh, specialty pharma distribution business. So they were a distributor that wasn't working on big margins. And they were always constantly deciding to work with drugs that had big absolute gross margins or better percentage margins. And they were trying to build their business with a, with a bit of two. So I understand the temptation for having even low margin business contribute to overhead. But if in terms of value, in terms of building value, the, the, if that was the, the key criteria, I would suggest getting rid of the poor performing profit margins and reduce your overhead, reduce your infrastructure because you're gonna have less revenue coming through the system. I know it's easy for me to sit here and say that, but that's because you know the details and the specifics matter. But that's a um, uh, that's how we typically uh, it typically shakes out for us. But that's a really good question because we get it all the time, you know, especially when we get started. Um, what is you know what is sacred in the business? What is sacred in the history of the business? the culture, the language. We believe every business has its own language, the family dynamics. You know, there's a lot that are sacred in the business and some of it is, you know, we got to have that product line uh, for whatever reason. And one of the reasons that it's, you know, it's easy for us to come in without our emotion and just analyzing the way that we do because emotion counts. It counts. It got your family business to where it is or your idea to where it is. And it, it's not that it doesn't count, it does. It's just that sometimes it can be managed um, more effectively 
by um, thinking about it analytically and thinking unemotionally. The last one I'm gonna talk about on this page is the practice, practice, practice. Um, so a lot of our clients, when we start with them, they don't, they don't do a lot of forecasting. They do budgets, perhaps, um, but forecasting in my mind is a little different. It tends to be a little broader thinking and it tends to go out further than just the current year to give you, you don't have to be in as great a detail the further you go out, but it's just to lay the tracks for um, how you're thinking about your business. And um, our recommendation is, you know, it's important. Uh, it's, a, it's a great way to follow the, the progress you're making or not making. And the more you do it, the better you get at it, just like everything else in life. And, you know, delivering the future is important to your family. It's important to other constituencies you have. It makes the company, delivering the future means it's like more likely a winner, as I talked earlier, than not. And as a result, it's going to be the kind of place that where people want to, um, where people want to work. One thing that I, that I haven't talked about yet that I wanted to bring up because of the audience, um, and that is the idea of family in the business. So we've worked for um, father, son, father, daughter, brother, sister, and then just a number of families, uh, whether it's first, second, or third generation. So we've worked with a lot of families. And one in particular, um, I remember it was a distribution business and they had 350 people in the company. And I called the head of HR and I said, so how many people, I, I felt like there was a lot of family in the business. and I called the HR and I said, um, so how many people are capital F family, brother, sister, father, daughter, um, and how many people are small F, close friends, cousins, distant cousins, second cousins, whatever. <laughs> it turned out to be about 60% of the company were small F. No, total, I'm sorry, the total between capital F and small F were 60%. And in the management team, it was not that high, but it turned out to be a, a a real issue for the company to move forward as to for its growth plans, being able to hire non-family to run the business with the idea that, you know, there was always going to be family there. So we had to construct a, a, a compensation plan that made sense. We worked for another company that was a construction company. And the goal was how can we um, set the company up best to, to, for the four kids to run it, the second generation, the oldest of which was, a sophomore in college when we started working for them. And what we created is a, is a senior management team, a leadership team that had, and this was a goal that was known within the company and the owner was very um, open about it. Um, so we had to figure out how to have them compete with the senior leadership team, knowing that there was going to be a ceiling as to where they uh, would get to. So we, we created uh, a leadership team more formally than had been, created a compensation plan that addressed it and created a sets of roles and responsibilities so that um, everybody felt comfortable that they uh, they had a place for a while in the business, if not forever. Um, so we've, we uh, have worked with the issue of family in the business uh, as long as I can remember, uh, going back to my investment banking days, I represented a number of family businesses. And um, uh, it's um, it's it's uh, it's something to think about as, as having to create opportunities for non-family in order to scale the business and drive it forward. So now let's talk a little bit about how to improve the value. So this is a chart that we've built over the years based on our experience with many different companies. It's got a lot on here. So this is how we, when we're working with a company, this is how we think about creating more value is we, we try to figure out where the company is today on these points and what are the important ones to drive uh, for a higher score in the future to create uh, better performance and better value. And sometimes we actually have the, the clients score themselves so that you can see the average score in the bottom, we we add up we add up the points and see where they are, where they think they are, and then we do it once we've had a chance to interview the management team and interview the owners, which is our key first step in our in our assignments. And typically, there's a gap. 
I mean, you wouldn't be surprised to uh, to to know that there's a gap. Um, and then sometimes there isn't. Sometimes there are very um, people have real are very uh, very cognizant of what their weak spots are. But this runs the gamut from market position, organization and leadership, and business model and financials. We've talked about some of these things already. But for example, in organization and leadership, you know, smart, motivated senior managers, quality of leadership, and decision making. So we worked for um, a company, private company, and um, after interviewing the senior leaders, we um, we gave our recommendations to the owner, and the first recommendation was to uh, he he signed. This was a company that was couple hundred million in revenue and he signed every check below $2,500. And so what it did is it slowed the company down because the decision-making in the company all came into that decision of, of writing a check because most of the decisions had checks behind them. And, um, you know, whether you want to hire somebody or uh, uh, take add on new inventory, et cetera. And um, so our first recommendation was to either increase that or find a CEO that to replace yourself um, because who would do that? Because the way they were making decisions was too centralized for uh, the company. It was slowing the company down. So even the idea of decision-making can impact value, in my opinion. And in that case, it actually did. At the bottom of organization and leadership, you see scalable growth plan. So this is what I, I mentioned, operating leverage. Um, margins increase as you grow. So, you know, SaaS products, software as a service products, that happens um, because, you know, the, the software product doesn't care if 10 million people are using it or one person is using it. It has amazing margins and, and increase as you grow. But that's the nirvana, not very, I say not very few, but most companies don't get to scale because there are hurdles in their business that prevent them from, from increasing margins as they grow or that there are um, uh, things that self-inflicted wounds that they're uh, creating that allow them to grow, but maybe not create more revenue. So not every company can do it, but it's certainly nirvana for those that can. On the right side, uh, 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 sorry, on the left side, market position. Uh, my, my colleague, Ivan Hernandez would say that the value proposition for branded and marketing assets is a key uh, driver of value for, for consumer facing businesses. Uh, and it's something that we look at quite, um, you know, their, their uh, traffic to their website, the uh, conversions, the eyeballs, et cetera, they're all important things to track because um, they create more value. On the financial, the business model and financial side, um, you know, the important ones are all revenues not created equal. And you know, having credibility in terms of the financial world. So many of our clients, not all, have sold one day, and our job was to prepare them for that. And I've never had a, a former client come back to me and say, "You made me overspend in finance, and I, I wish that you hadn't." So I, I think that finance, even though it's not a revenue-producing area, is one of the most important areas of the of the company, because it's where you keep track of how you're doing and setting the scorecard for everybody in the company. And whether you have any intention of selling or not, uh, one of the places I think that most companies should spend more money on talent is finance. Because knowing where you're at and knowing how you're doing relative to forecast and using comparative financials to the prior year or the prior 12 months, latest 12 months or the against the, the forecast, to me is uh, having a better, a best sense that you can about where you're at. Any thoughts or questions from anybody uh, at this point? Nothing on the Q&A right now, but I'm writing a few down that'll be applicable towards the end, Murph, thanks. Okay. So the last um, uh, section we wanna talk about is succession. And the reason is because we, we think of succession a little differently. We think of it in three dimensions. We think of management succession, which is the way a lot of people think of it. And we think of ownership, ownership succession and income succession. So clearly management succession, having family run the company, having outsiders, 
uh, professional managers run the company, having family and outsiders run the company are all kind of different choices, of course, that you, I'm sure you're familiar with and, and have used or are using. And hiring, you know, sometimes we work with owners and they decide that they don't want to be CEO anymore and they want to have a family or an outsider replace them and they just want to be an owner. Those are all kind of management succession options that are always on the table for companies. But they're separate and different from ownership and income succession options. So you have choices of selling your ownership, some of it, a majority, a minority, to fund growth or liquidity. You can grant um, ownership rights to ownership or uh, income percentages to your leadership team, to other family members who maybe aren't shareholders. Um, I know of a, of a family business where the, uh, the two owners who are relatives have um, a, uh, a, another family in the business who gets a percentage of, uh, of cash flow uh, of EBITDA for, their, um, for his efforts, and they, they take uh, any distributions that are available. So it just depends on what. And then there's also recapitalization opportunities where you can use an ESOP, for example, or use a, uh, you know, take on, which you typically take on debt through this structure of an ESOP, which the government has set up, and it's very advantageous. It can be very advantageous for the right set of circumstances where you get to deduct not only the principal, but the, or, sorry, not only the interest, but the principal of the loan that you use to pay to, to buy back some of your stock, as long as the, the ESOP ends up owning more than 30% of the company. You can also do uh, buyback stock, whether it's you lever up to do that, and you can do a dividend recap, which is where you lever up with bank debt and pay a dividend. So those are all, re, uh, those are more um, for liquidity options. But so to, with every company that we work with, we're dealing with one or all of these options uh, in terms of the succession for the company. And, you know, it just depends on what their particular needs are. We've had plenty where we've uh, found uh, the right um, partner for liquidity events. We've had plenty where we've had several where we grant ownership to key, key people on the leadership team. And we've had a number where the, the, uh, the owner wants to supplement his, the family uh managers in the business with outside managers. And we've had a few where they want to replace themselves at CEO. So um, and I, my sense is any or all of these can be a key to unlocking value in the business because it's, it's you know, deemed important for the owner to, to go down one of these paths. And they're all available to most companies. Murph, quick question on this yeah. that's come up before and also here. Uh, so talk a little bit about that. A, a family business owner brings in a non-family CEO as an example, and part of the compensation package is to give them some ownership in the business. Five, 10, two, seven, whatever years later, that CEO leaves. You, you have buyback stock from select shareholders. Can you touch briefly on, don't, don't do a, a, a finance 501 course on how this works now, but just briefly on how that would work from your, your experience? Yeah, well, uh, you would... You would likely have an agreement, a shareholders or a, a, an employment contract, where the that would be spelled out what happens. We we have one uh, client that has a non-family uh, shareholder, or sorry, non-family CEO, and um, the way that we decided we, we decided in that case to set it up was as a, a, a percent of proceeds of the sale of the business, which is probably going to happen in the next six, four to six months. Um, and we've been working with them for eight or nine years now, long time. Um, and so it's very specifically set up where um, that CEO is going to get a piece of the proceeds of the business uh, after a certain level. Um, so that's one way to handle it. The other, the other ways are, you know, why they left, um, which again would be spelled out in the contract, which is, you know, for cause or not for cause. Um, generally for cause, there isn't uh, anything that paid out, but if, if there's not for cause, then they, um, they will have a payout of some sort. And usually it's, it's, um, it done in installments so that it isn't a burden to the company to be able to make. Is that what you were thinking of, Ed? Yeah, very consistent with the uh, topics of conversation I've had with some family businesses lately. And then one of the questions that popped up. So thanks. Yeah, I mean, it, and one of the issues that I know a lot of family businesses struggle with is, well, what if I don't like them? You know, it, it, what if they don't work out? Um, 
you know, that's where you need to build. A, 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 and, and it's a short term. It's, you know, not it's not a five year stay where everything worked well. It's a it's a six and a half month stay that that didn't work out well. Well, that's got to be in the contract, too, is what happens if there's a people want a divorce after a certain period of time. Um, and one thing that I always suggest to owners as it relates to the roles and responsibilities of a situation like that is to um, to have them work and be responsible for a certain set of responsibilities and then add as they prove them them worthy, add more. You know, so, for example, in one case, we we said that um, the new CEO couldn't fire a senior a member of the senior leadership team until after six months. So um, then they would have the right to do that. And then after 12 months, they could do other, they had a certain other rights so that they sort of earned their way, <laughs> excuse me, into a broader set of roles and responsibilities for the company so that the owners felt good about the fact that they had, um, they had earned that right, basically. Excellent. Thanks, Murph. Sure. So we're winding down here. Now we're uh, just a quick uh, um, uh, reminder of who we are, J.K. Murphy Advisors. This is uh, my colleague, Andy, who's on the call. His background is in operations. He's a master black belt in Lean and Six Sigma. For those of you who know what it is, it means that he's really smart in operations <laughs> and uh, runs circles around me as it relates to how to improve everything from a service business, the operations of a service business to a manufacturing company. You see his background. He's worked for a number of uh, corporates in the world. Uh, Ivan, uh, my buddy from uh, Miami, who uh, is a marketing specialist, cut his chops at Red Bull and Muscle Milk. So he's extremely um, uh, adept in the, in the B2C world. Uh, we, we've also had him uh, uh, involved in uh, several B2B companies. So um, he's uh, great with strategy and driving people to your website and uh, optimization and uh, delighted to have him on the team as well. This is one chart that we talk about um, in, um, uh, in, our, in our decks. The on the left side are all the issues that we tend to get involved with, not with every company, but um, you know, those are the key big issues, how to grow, what strategy to create growth, risk tolerance. We talked about that operations and performance, how to improve the operations and performance succession planning. We just talked about that. There can be a number of ways to improve or to deal with succession planning in a business. And then how do all these things lead to market value? And our, our, uh, uh, what we do is we feel like we provide this, these, uh, uh, solutions to these issues with speed and greater confidence than companies can on their own because it's all we do for a living. Uh, there's a couple pages of success stories, which I won't go into because that's pretty boring. And, uh, and then a last page to say thank you. Um, I've appreciated it, Ed. I hope, I hope everybody's gotten some, one little nugget from it, uh, perhaps uh, even one little idea from it. Um, are there any other questions that anybody might have as, uh, before, we, uh, before we sign off? please feel free to put them in the Q&A. We'll watch that Q&A, but as I thank you, Murph, um, you mentioned how people can reach out to you and thank you so much for this information, the comments that have come through on my text messages and emails from those that are on board that are, have joined us today have been very, very great. Um, as you can see from this last 45 minutes, Murph is a and his team are tremendous um, assets for all of you who may have issues in succession planning strategy, those areas that we've talked about today. Um, so Murph, thank you for your time and for joining us today. For sure. any of you who have questions, the, the screen on in front of us is how you can reach Murph and his team. He's here in Southern California, but they work everywhere. Like all of us now, we're all sitting here in our, in our homes and offices and so forth on this particular webinar. Um, we alluded to a video from our chairman, Mike Deerberg. That's available on our website at first, first.bank forward slash family business. Uh, it'll also be on this recording if you share this with your friends and colleagues as we go forward. On our website, you'll also have access to all of our other webinars that we've done, our calendar of events that are coming up. Um, Joe Ambrose and I uh, are dedicated as, as the leaders of the Center for Family-Owned Businesses, as well as our entire family business-owned bank, to being a resource for you, the family business owner, advisor, or employee, or leader. 
uh, through webinars, podcasts. Uh, we do live events. We have a, a philanthropy event coming up in Orange County in August. That information is on our site. We have a symposium for two days up in Santa Barbara coming up, uh, a VIP invitation only. But if you'd like an invitation to that, please reach out to Joe or myself and we'll talk that through with you. Um, Josh Barron, who will be one of our presenters at that symposium in October, will be our next webinar guest in September. We will be taking August. We won't be taking August off, but we won't be having a webinar in August. We have our nonprofit event that we'll be sharing in lieu of the webinar uh, on August the 15th. So stay tuned for more information on that. If you have any questions about other ways that we at First Bank or the center or individuals like uh, Murph can assist you and your family business, you can just reach out to us through our website. Uh, you can reach Joe at joe.ambrose at fbol.com and you can reach me at ed.hart at fbol.com or anybody at the bank first.last at fbol.com. So thank you for your time today. Again, Murph, thank you so much for- and that I just want to today. add, Please. I've known I've known you for 20 years and uh, not that you guys need a plug, but uh, nobody's ever built a community like Ed has in the family business world. I mean, I've been I've had glimpses of it in the past and now recently more uh, exposure to it. And you just have a way ahead of being uh, helping people and feeling and having people put their guard down so that they that they get involved and you've done an amazing job so i'm thrilled to be a part of it thank you for having me here obviously you got the check i sent and you cashed it so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for my, appreciate the love and um we you know we're passionate about what we do the whole reason the first bank center for family owned businesses exists is first and foremost we are a family business 113 years ago the dearberg family uh, purchased a small bank it's turned into um, this wonderful regional bank in Missouri and, and California, and we're here to serve your needs. Um, and again, not just your banking and your wealth management and so forth needs, but we, as you can tell from today's conversation, we're here for your entire organization and family. If there's somebody in the family that has a need, regardless of what it is, we have a resource for you. So please reach out. And that need is literally exponential. I mean, we've talked with families about everything. Anything and everything. So we're here. So we're thank you for that that plug and thank you all for sticking with us today and joining us. You have a lot of options for what you could have done with this last hour. And we appreciate that you've chosen to spend that time with us. So on behalf of Michael Deerberg, Shelly Seifert, our CEO, Joe Ambrose, our executive chairman, and myself and the entire First Bank team. Again, we want to thank you for joining us today. And, and again, go to first.bank forward slash family business for any and all additional information. And with that, we appreciate your time. Have a wonderful rest of the day.